All right, seniors. Well, here we go. The ending of Macbeth, last act, and uh, a pretty good one, honestly. Um, Shakespeare's not the best, in my opinion, of ending his tragedies particularly, but I feel like Macbeth, he handles really well. Uh, it's probably the, my favorite of those. So now Macbeth's not my favorite tragedy, but definitely the ending, I think, is the most fitting. So lots of rapid fire scenes in this one, which is, again, really common for acts four and five. Um, now, like in Macbeth, act four had three and they were two of them were rather long but uh you know you see this a lot and this one's got a lot of them so we're gonna look at them like scene by scene and just kind of give you some major high points that you can use and talk about some important elements that you may see on the test okay so scene one we just have a doc random doctor and a random like handmaiden discussing something and they're discussing mainly a new habit that lady Macbeth has picked up where she's sleepwalking. She's sleepwalking through the castle, and the, the doctor's asking questions about it because he's never seen it, and the ma handmaiden won't really tell him. I mean, it says gentlewoman on here, but I, I assume it's one of her servants. She won't tell him what she's saying because she says she's not just sleepwalking, she's sleep talking. So she says, I can't tell you what she says because I shouldn't utter that. Um, and then on cue, she appears sleepwalking, and she's basically recounting their crimes. She talks about Duncan when she says, who knew the old man had so much blood in him? She talks, she says the Thane of Fife had a wife, and she kind of chuckles depending on, like in the video I, I sent you guys, she's laughing about it. But the Thane of Fife is Macduff, so she's referencing the death of Macduff's wife. She talks about Banquo being buried, even though she doesn't know about that. She still references it, so kind of like, I guess she kind of assumes. So she mentions all these things, and the doctor becomes really disturbed, and he tells this uh, servant woman to ignore all that. Because here's the problem. They don't live in 2021 where you can turn people in for murder. Who are they going to tell? Honestly, you go tell Macbeth. That would be you're dead. And to to tell anyone else you don't know. Remember this this they're, they're very paranoid right now. All these people are about who's spying for Macbeth. So really they just have to keep their mouth shut and they can't tell anybody. One of the key things the doctor does say, he points out that her situation is beyond his means of helping her. He can't really do anything to improve her situation. So he, uh, you know, he, he indicates she needs a priest, not a doctor. So, but what we're seeing through this section is that, Mac, that Lady Macbeth has finally come full circle from being the bloodthirsty, I don't care, to eaten up with guilt, you know, the way we flip the two. You know, originally Macbeth was eaten up with guilt, and we're about to find out he's the bloodthirsty one. So I told you guys that we were gonna see this happen. You know, we had him on polar opposites in act one, and act three, they cross and kind of, you know, meet when they were talking about, um, you know, to be thus is nothing if not to be safely thus when that whole section comes up. And then here at the end in act five, we have them both flipping sides. So kind of interesting. Okay, scene two comes up. Scene two is really just a, you know, transitional scene. It's very short. It just introduces these. We know that the army is approaching. We also get the name drops of Dunsinane and Burnham Wood, which are part of the prophecy that Macbeth is going to echo here in scene three when it begins. But really, it's just to let us know that uh, they're going this way. We also find out that Macbeth really doesn't have an army. He's got an army, but those people don't really want to fight with him. They fight on his side. Um, they're just scared of him. And once they realize there's a way out, they're probably going to throw down their weapons or even just join the other side. So it all, you know, all indicators point to Macbeth's about to get his butt, butt stomped, okay? Scene three comes up. We get to see Macbeth and his, like, mental state here. And Macbeth is still very cocky. He is holding on to those prophecies, the Burnham Wood prophecy, as well as that he can't be harmed of a, from a man born of a woman or of anyone born of a woman. So we still get that about him. He's very, very uh, cocky about this. When he finds out there's a massive force of 10,000 marching toward him, he gets very angry. And, you know, because he realizes he's not able to compete with that. So we get this indication that he's probably going to, uh, you know, try to go in for, settle in for a siege because he has a smaller army and has a better chance. Because, you know, you got 10,000 soldiers outside. They have to find a way to be fed and to take care of basic needs and you know he has a much smaller army and he has his castle where all this stuff is already gathered so honestly if he does choose to sit in for a siege he has a chance of at least getting these people to leave all right um Macbeth does there's a couple of things about Macbeth that are still noble and I want to point that out Shakespeare doesn't make you know one-dimensional flat main characters he just does not do that Macbeth is still a noble character. The fact that Macbeth is willing to fight anyway, even though it looks like all odds are stacked against him, is a noble 
even though he's fighting for the wrong things and he's doing awful stuff in the, in the process, I think it's noble that he does that. Now, he is allowing himself to believe uh, something that is true, but he should know better, okay? We, we often find ourselves, you know, giving in and believing things that have no reality. They're not grounded in reality, but we think they're going to be true because that's what we want really badly. And, you know, at some point we have to purge this in our way of thinking. Just because you want something doesn't mean it's going to happen. Just because you feel like it should, just because you feel like God wants this for you or for, you know, your family or for your state or whatever, your country, doesn't mean it's going to happen, okay? doesn't mean you're right either, just for the record. And obviously the best thing here for Scotland is for Macbeth to go, you know, go go pack him. But, um, you know, uh, as we get into this, he, he also talks to the doctor. Finds out his wife is is pretty damaged right now. His response is basically to just give her something to help her sleep. He's he doesn't understand why they can't help her right now. And of course, the point again is that it, there's no way to fix her. She's not physically hurt. She is mentally and spiritually damaged, and that's the problem. We need to see about how guilt devours these people. Okay. Okay, scene four, we find out how the Burnham Wood prophecy is going to come true. The army gets to Burnham Wood, and they realize that if they come 10,000 strong, Macbeth's going to do what we just said. He's going to lock, you know, lock everything down for a siege. So they decide they need to hide their numbers and make it look like there's a smaller army, so maybe he'll come out and fight. They're going to do this by cutting the tree limbs and cutting trees, smaller trees down from Burnham Wood to hide their army. So as they're approaching the castle, it's going to look like there's a forest moving. Okay, so again, the trick with these prophecies is that they're technically going to come true, but they come true in a dirty way. All right. All right. At that back point, we get back to Macbeth, and we it begins this scene five, which is on your book. In your book is page four away. We hear uh, you find a woman scream, and what has happened is Lady Macbeth has finally hit her limits. She has committed suicide. She jumps off of the castle battlements and is now dead. We get a real tender scene with Macbeth, where Macbeth is obviously upset about this. Um, you also get the most famous lines from this play, and in my opinion, and I've told my classes, it's my second favorite section of writing in Shakespeare. My favorite line, and I, my, this is my favorite longer piece. My favorite line in Shakespeare is "Hell is empty, and all the de uh, devils or all the demons, I forget which one, are here." Uh, I love that line, but uh, this also is really pretty, in my opinion. Now, I like darker things like this. Um, I'm not only saying I agree with the concepts, but I really like the, the, the discussion they brewed, okay? So it's on page 409, and it begins with Macbeth's first speech there. Uh, I usually skip the first two lines because this is no, this, the tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow are the, uh, is the line that typically starts this. So I'm going to read it for you. It says, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. Now, I could read that much more dramatically for you. There, there's a lot more depth to that, but that sounds ridiculous. I'm not going to do it to you. Um, but really, he's pointing out how transitory life is, that it ends quickly. And all honesty, we spend a lot of time worrying about it, like, like our lives and our choices and the things we do are of the utmost importance. What he's really pointing out is, is that they're not. He compares this uh, uh, the analogy to it being like a person who has like one line in a play and is not a very good actor. So that's why they only have one line. And they sit backstage and they stress over that one line. And then the time comes and they say it and no one gives a rip about it. And then they leave the stage and no one hears from them ever again. He says, that's us. You know, we stress about all of these things. We put so much emphasis on, you know, our choices and our decisions and our, you know, the outcomes and the consequences we have. When in all honesty, when you look at it as a big picture, we are such a small part of the world as it is now and even, you know, throughout time. So, um, yeah, some people take that as depressing. You know, like, you know, I really don't matter that much. And no one's saying you don't. And especially speaking from a Christian perspective, it's not that you don't matter to God. It's just that your decision on which college you're going to attend – in the grand scheme of things, is not going to affect that much. It's going to affect how much your loan is, maybe, which will impact your life going forward. But, you know, this, the city of Mobile is not going to change if you decide to go to South instead of Auburn, all right? Um, the state of Alabama is not going to be altered by this. You know, the world, time is not going to be altered by this. Yet we put so much emphasis, like, you know, trying to make these decisions, and we, we act like they are, you know, the most important things in the world. And they are to you. But they're not to the world, and they're not to other people. And Macbeth's kind of just pointing out the pointlessness in some ways of life. 
You know, obviously, this is the way he's going to be feeling. The first half of it, he talks about how monotonous life is and how it just creeps on and on and on, and everything's just leading to our death, eventual death. Uh, and of course, Macbeth's a, in, you know, this is what guilt does to you. It makes you not value the things you have. It makes you depressed. It makes you paranoid, all of those things. And that's where Macbeth is right now. At that point, a messenger shows up and lets him know that Burnham Wood looks like it's marching. And Macbeth realizes now, maybe I've been duped. But again, he's not going to give up because he still has that last one prophecy. He's still got the whole, you know, and obviously no person can not be born of a woman, especially not in this time period. So not, not really a thing. He's, he thinks I've still got that to hold on to. All right, scene six begins very short. That's just we know they're at the castle. Um, and then scene seven begins. We get this weird little scene, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on the video with this. If you were in class, you got some info on this. If you weren't, uh, it's okay. I'm not going to put this on the test. But the battle with Macbeth and this person called Young Seward, who's actually the general Seward, the guy who commands really these 10,000 soldiers. It's his son. Uh, Macbeth fights him. Uh, my phone's ringing. Okay, sorry about that. That that was a phone call that just threw me out, and I'll, I'm sorry for that pause, but I'm back. Um, so what we have here is that uh, this Macbeth gets a chance to re-utter his uh, thing about, I can't be harmed by a woman born. He says that again, and also it provides um, an opportunity for us to see um, this. this uh, 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 let me come back to this. Let me come back to this. We're going to come back to it at the end. I, it's really not important, but I just want to point it out. Okay, we go to scene eight, and we get the Macbeth and Macduff fight, all right? And Macduff has really just been avoiding fighting anyone. He knows it's not anyone else's fault. He wants to kill Macbeth. Uh, Macbeth killed his family. He owes him. So let me see if I can see who called me real quick, guys. That is 100% a spam call that just interrupted me. Well, we're going to keep going. Uh, so, um, so Macbeth is... Uh, you know, still confident. He's like, you know, I can get Macduff. You were born of a woman, so you can't touch me. And then Macduff breaks the news Macbeth did not want to hear. He tells him flat out, ah, oh, well, the joke's on you. I was, when he says he's ripped untimely from his mother's womb, Macduff's mother died before he was born. And they saved him by basically, you know, primitive cesarean section. They rip her, rip him out. His mother's already dead. So, Technically, you know, if you want to be really, really play with the wording, his mother wasn't alive anymore. She was a corpse when he was born. So that's the loophole. And Macbeth realizes it right away and starts to backpedal. We see a tiny glimpse of cowardice here with Macbeth. But then uh, he comes back around. He's like, you know what? I'm not going to I'm not kissing Malcolm's ring. I'm not going to be, you know, I, I'm, this isn't happening. You're just going to have to kill me. And that's what happens. Macduff kills him and is excited about it. Then we get this, like, the very ending, where this young Seward thing comes back in. His dad, uh, the older Seward, is told that your son uh, was dead. They, they lost very few troops, but that was one of them. And uh, the dad shows a little bit of remorse, and then he asks a very confusing question. He says, was it where his wounds on the back or the front? And basically, he's asking there, was he running away? Was he being a coward when he was killed, or was he killed straight up in a fight? They indicate he was killed fighting. He was killed by Macbeth, but in a definite, like, you know, face-to-face -face fight. And the dad kind of is like, okay, well, that's the best you can ask for uh, from a child to die this way. And I feel like this is like a really unnecessary part of the play, but uh, it does kind of throw, you can have minor themes in a major work like this. It's not just about one main lesson. And the idea here, it, there could be a couple of things. Shakespeare loves to write about bad parents. And this one, to me is an example of one. I get that he's honoring his son, but still, you know, remember how Macduff acted when he lost his kids. I mean, he was, you know, distraught. This guy blows it off completely. So, I mean, is it another of Shakespearean's comments, uh, another Shakespearean comment on bad parenting? Perhaps. Maybe it's a thing, a statement about bravery. You know, there's a lot of things you can do with it. But, I mean, I'm not going to ask you to on the test, so no worries. Then we get to the very end, and Shakespeare likes to have the person who reestablishes re order after all the chaos gets the final lines. And that's going to be Malcolm here, because Malcolm's going to be the king. Now, of course, we know down the road, Banquo's family is going to take over. But at this point, Banquo's not king. Macduff is not king, for those of you who put that. Um, Seward is not king. And it's going to be Malcolm who takes over. And he gives a really important final little speech here, and he indicates something that historically is important. You're not going to be thanes anymore. Now you're going to be earls or dukes and things like that. He says earls. Uh, yes, he says henceforth be earls. Now, just a different title, right? Not totally. It's a different title as far as you know ownership from what I've been led to understand. Okay, I'm no I'm no means an expert here. 
But thanes to me are people who are still, you know, the king has gifted you with this land, but it's really not yours. It's still the king's, you know, and it can easily be transitioned from person to person. I believe an earl, on the other hand, and this is like family land at this point, it can be handed down. I think thanes had to earn more of their their spot. So if you if you if your children were weak and, you know, couldn't fight and became, you know, just not, not a really great representation of your country, I feel like that land could be taken and given to another another great warrior as a reward. I feel like the earls, that wasn't the case. Now, my knowledge of these terms is not in any way uh, expertise, I promise. So um, I just feel like it's important. He does make that distinction. So I feel like there's there's obviously a reason just changing the name is not enough okay all right well there you go that's the end of macbeth a little bit flawed at the end there but the macbeth's death is fitting the fact that macduff kills him yes macduff's like way around the prophecy is a bit weird but um it works uh and you know as it ends hopefully that's good for scotland going forward Okay. So I hope you guys liked Macbeth. Um, a lot of the kids in class seemed to, they seemed to enjoy it, seemed to think it was a pretty good play. Um, I personally, it's, it's one of my favorites. It's not my favorite, but it's definitely one of them. And I feel like those lines, the tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow speech is, is just, it's some of the most beautiful lines ever written. Uh, and it's some of the most impactful lines ever written. But anyway, I hope you guys enjoy this. We are done with Macbeth. So we're going to be looking at testing here soon. Um, I don't want to really give a date because if I use these videos in upcoming years that may not hold up, but it will be in the next few days. Um, and, and you guys will know from your agendas when those that test is coming up. So uh, best of luck on it. I think you'll do well. The Macbeth test is typically not one of the lower scored ones because people, you know, for the most part, like it. And they at least get the, the, the main plot points. So uh, anyway, best of luck to you. And thank you again for taking the time to watch these. Um, I do appreciate that. It makes doing them worth it. So, all right. Well, guys, have a great afternoon and evening. And uh, we will see you when it comes to test time.